Automatically on the lake to survive, they needed to uh, be uh, well skilled at living off the land. They depended on the land like a farmer depends on his field. Where all the good places are for fishing year round, that's where the people used to stay hunting, fishing, and trapping. Just to live together with uh, around Cargo Point. Uh, the end of the point there. Today, where Francis Taddeus got his cabin there. There's a river there. The river used to be open uh, year round eh, all winter. And that's where mostly people survive from there. They get fish there all winter. Eh? That was one of the main item that food was fish. Eh? They would catch one fish and oh, when they were happy. You know, they're going to survive for another day. Fish is uh, one of the uh, good food for human beings. Fish and meat is a little different. Uh, fish, like, it, it keeps you warm. And uh, you don't get hungry right away. Uh, definitely with a little bit of meat. Meat, you, you feel cold and you get hungry right away. Fish is different. A lot of oil in there keeps you warm and uh, good for the blood. This is what you call a great bear lake herring. For fishing all year round, like uh, John Hoare River, Caribou Point, Deep River, Snow River and all that, and Campsell River, and the Whitefish River, and especially Mouthed River here, uh, Great Bird River. During those days, the people that dealt in there, they migrated with the animals. It, it was hard to get him to eat. Like uh, people tried really hard to survive, get ptarmigan, rabbit, moose, caribou. And uh, you have to go further in order to get the muskox. And now, so two years do not go like it in, do not go like it in. In that back connected it's in a wedding car, a wedding of wallet. Send it, it's in so go so get there. I can never like in that go. In that sure, I die loud, it is in sure. The seed and the rabbit are out. Betsare <laughs> the Dene people, you know, their, their dependency and uh, on uh, wildlife is uh, really important, but they also connect that with um, a higher power. It says, you know, somebody put this stuff here for us. We have to look after it if we're going to survive. Listening to the elders and their stories, and they, they talk about how it's important for you to understand wildlife. Because if you needed to eat, you had to somehow be able to catch this wildlife. And in the old days, you didn't have uh, rifles and um, you know snowmobiles that are fast enough to keep up with animals. So they had to really depend on their skill. But not only the skill, they had to also be able to communicate with animals. And um, some people would have medicine power. 
spiritually they were connected to the animals and they listened to the elders and how they talk about wildlife and uh, how some people might have power for medicine for for uh, caribou or uh, wolf or moose and so there was uh, people that uh, that actually uh, did that kind of stuff and um, to this day I don't know if anybody still has it uh, or if it has passed down or not but uh, it's still that type of uh, thought and thinking is still important to the people here. Even though we live in modern houses today, our people still depend uh, quite heavily on the traditional food, um, caribou and the, and the fish. And so uh, without that, uh, you know, our people always said, you know, they're, they're nothing after that without the food and stuff like that. So when uh, Aboriginal people talk about um, protecting the land and the wildlife, it's mainly it's for that. It's for that generation to come in after us looking after them and making sure that they have stuff that they can depend on. So it's really important to them to look after the, the land and the wildlife. Talking with the elders and uh, understanding the, uh, the story of that area, uh, the old prophet Aya predicted that uh, that was an area that people should stay away from. When he was talking with his people, he always told them when you travel that area to travel around it. He had no contact with the, the outside world because he's basically a, a bush, bush guy. He passed away in 1940. At the time, people, you know, he kept telling people stories about what he thinks was going to happen in the future. People are starting to realize that, you know, a lot of the stories are true and things are actually happening based on what he was saying. So he basically predicted certain events and stuff like that. Yoni was basically the guy that uh, discovered the uranium there. He gave it off to uh, Labine. And Labine uh, laid claim to the to the find, and uh, ever since then they started sort of mining uh, radium there. He told stories about people how he uh, saw what people were going to do with the uranium and uh, the dropping of the bombs in Hiroshima. The mine was, you know, was first developed in uh, approximately 1930 to produce radium. It's important to understand that Dillany, uh, when they discovered the mine didn't exist. Uh, our people lived nomadically around the lake, so a lot of our people lived on that side. When the mine started up, they started doing some work for the, uh, for the mine back then, you know, getting wood, and uh, then slowly they started getting onto the transportation boats. Okay. Port a radium mine for about uh, 10 years. Late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, it was shut down and, and opened again as a uranium mine. 
And it was during the Second World War that the government of Canada took over the mine site from the private owners and operated it under El Dorado Nuclear. It was a top secret military site when the government took it over. They didn't want anybody to know that Canada had access to uranium, which could be used for, for bombs uh, in the protection of uh, this country and other countries. You know, when you go back and look at the history and photos and stuff like that, you, you know, it's hard to believe that uh, that place had about 1,500 people there. And uh, yeah, it was the biggest uh, town in uh, Northwest Territories. They had a bar there, they had a uh, curling, curling rink, um, tennis court, outside tennis court, and they had pretty much everything there. I helped my dad cutting logs for uh, lumber to build up all those uh, houses that poured radium in, cutting the logs to for fuel. They have boilers, so they use all those boilers to do all the cooking and uh, heating up all the bunkhouses. And then uh, way inside the mine, they use that for steam. Eh? We depend mostly on each other too, like and then for eating. Eh? It was very hard, and so uh, we have to hunt. So they look after each other really good. No matter if it, if it was a newcomer or all that, they look like after them really good. Especially like Paul Reading, all the prospector and miners. It was hard time, and uh, uh, the elders uh, feed them fish and uh, moose meat and caribou meat to the miners. For exchange, they uh, give them groceries and all that. The women, they maintain their uh, their uh, moccasin and uh, parky and uh, mitts. Like a lot of the Dene people there, uh, they haul the ore, or right? right from the mine, 120, 125 pounds of bags. That was very heavy. They would haul all the stuff from the stockpile, wherever that little shop is, uh, wherever they fill up the that bag with the ore, and then they would sew it all up, sew up these bags, and then the local native people there. From there they were take you to the barge. Eh? It's not close. <laughs> it's about I'll say about half a mile. Eh? There's uh, no vehicle or anything at those days. Eh? So everything's got to be carried on the shoulder. Everything. Radium Gerber Tunnel Sende, Bars Nick Sende, Kuyue, the Kikili. The Kikili. The Tunnel Oki in the Get on the Sedge. Not <laughs> 1956. During the construction and the mining, they dumped uh, about a million tons of tailings into the lake. They operated it up till the 60s, and then uh, they sold it off, and the uh, Echo Bay Mines bought it and uh, started mining silver. When they cleaned it up, they uh, decommissioned it as a silver mine, so it was never cleaned as a uranium mine. I see one word don't take it away, well, listen. Do you tell no palana said, yea, yea, in Latak, eh? Are you no palana said, yea, in two years, single dealer? The Paul and Kenny, Johnny Takazo, Jonazo, Dennis, are you know? Say, I got a lot of silly do. Can't I? In Tassin, in the Chancellor. Say, Jenny, get a 
Sirityä sonine. Ai ga ga lai tano ne. Ane fengo te ni chenja. A ji te ai a cha sonne. Pyti on de sirine do. I realized they had a problem with poor radium after the land claims was done. On top of the hill there is a tennis court. When we selected lands, we selected lands in that vicinity. And not knowing that, that you know, most of the land could have been uh, contaminated or the lake was contaminated. When we um, went through the process of land claims. I find it interesting talking to the elders because at that time when we were sitting down to them, explaining to them that they had to select land, eh? and uh, we told them, you have to categorize which land's really important to you and which one's less important, so when we select the lands, we can make sure we get all the important lands. So the elders are kind of sitting there with a smirk on their face. They say, all the land's important to us, so how do we tell which land is more important? It's, it's, you know, that was, so it was a kind of a funny process, but when they selected lands, they selected lands in that area. And it's, it was after that that we uh, started figuring out, you know, that um, they've dumped a million tons of tailings into the lake and then also uh, had a bunch of it on the, on the ground. They um, were mining radium when they first started dumping. Uh, they took all the radium out of it, and then they dumped it into the lake. They uh, redredged it when they found out the importance of uranium. So they took it all back out and re reprocessed it for uranium, and then dumped it back into the lake again. All the radioactive uh, materials that we found there is all on land. Some places they have high levels, some places it's low. But um, basically, the waste rock is the rock that they used to take out of the mines when they're, when they're trying to get into uh, haul uranium. And then they use that to build the roads. But that, that rock is uh, radioactive. I, I don't know if the mine actually told anybody about uh, you know, what the stuff is for. All I know is that through our interviews and, and uh, research with respect to the elders and the traditional knowledge is that the, they had no clue what it was for. Mola say, Gotla in De Galai Dagosa, Imola Army, I think, Go on a hair goat, Egalai Talako, Yagalas, I done it and never seen. Said that Nakata Janaka eat and Hanai Guagosa. Go on a hair goat. Did he hear Army, I think? Japanese So when people say, well, well, they never told us, I think the main concern was around what was in the ore bags and what was the effect of the ore bags on the people. Uh, first cancer patient died in the 60s. They uh, shipped them out to Newick, and uh, they never did bring them back. Over the years, we started, really started noticing in the 80s that a lot of people were passing away. I think there's one period there where um, you know, we lost like seven, eight people in a matter of two years. Five or six years ago, I, uh, I've uh, gotten really involved in hand games, and uh, every time there was uh, uh, people coming from other communities to play, I, was, I always wanted to be in there and, and playing with them because it was an exciting game. And when the communities come and the dog groups came, I recall them all sitting you know, amongst the walls there and all the elders from the dog community. And um, 
and uh, they had all their players there waiting. And um, it, it first first time it dawned on me that uh, when I walked in there and I said, "Geez, you know, where's where's the Dillon A players?" Uh, and I looked around, I looked and I looked, and I saw only Dogger Elders and very few uh, Dillon A elders, which was the first time it really. Uh, it really hit me that uh, we had uh, no elders, and um, it sure put a lump in my throat. And I, I had to go out and uh, calm myself down because uh, I actually started uh, crying because of that. And uh, I didn't realize something like that would have an impact on me. Um, but uh, I can imagine what it has on on the rest of the community and its family members. It's almost like the families don't even have time to, to grieve or, you know, to say goodbye properly. It's by the time they're just finishing one, another one dies. And uh, 30 some people uh, died of cancer. Some of the mistrust goes way back to the never government of Canada, the mine, didn't tell the people of Delaney what was going on. At that time, the health effects were known to some extent, but it was in the early days. It was mostly around the health effects related to uh, health workers in hospitals and laboratories. Cindy Gildy, a former uh, member that started the whole process, um, her father um, uh, worked at the mine and he passed away from cancer and some of her uh, relatives and, and uh, some of the family members also um, started asking questions about whether or not there was a connection. She formed a, a group, um, the Dillon Uranium uh, Committee, and uh, to look at this issue and uh, to try to get Canada's attention to, to deal with it. Cindy spearheaded uh, all the work uh, along with uh, Gina Bea and some of their committee members that I, I recall, Joel Blondin Jr., Huey Ferdinand, Morse Nieli, Paul Baton. There's a whole series of other individuals that they, they worked with and uh, they've done a tremendous job with respect to trying to get this uh, issue raised with Canada. And 
From Canada's point of view, Canada being the federal government, uh, we saw it from the beginning as a matter of uh, working closely with the community in partnership with the community of Delaunay and the people of Delaunay to try and address the concerns that they were expressing through various media and various forms about the uh, Port Radium mine. The process was set up as a partnership. Uh, we, we used our experience in dealing with other Aboriginal communities and small communities in the north, other parts of Canada, and put together essentially a fairly uh, unique partnership between uh, the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs and the community of Delaunay as represented by the Chief and Council. That process became known as the Canada Delaunay Table. The committee came up with uh, 14 points that they used that uh, Canada, we want Canada to, to, to look at and address with us. They are a range of things from uh, environmental conditions, whether or not the uh, mine site is safe today in terms of the fish and the caribou and so on, to the uh, understanding uh, the current and past impacts on people of Delaunay in terms of their health, and trying to understand some of the facts, some of the historical circumstances that around the mine site itself. It's unique because um, they've never done this approach before, and they're not used to, you know, taking advice and working with the community and community making decisions, and sometimes they're going to have to abide by those decisions themselves. Those 14 points were transferred through community involvement, community workshops and discussion with the community, with experts and so on. They were transferred and moved into what we called 77 questions. Essentially, we asked the community at large of Delaunay and we asked the science community and we asked the federal government what it is we don't know or we need to know more about on the Port Radium mine site and the associated uh, transportation route of the ore, moving the ore or the ore and the concentrate from Port Radium uh, south. What are the environmental effects, past, current, future? What's the effects on Great Bear Lake, fish, caribou, air, water, land? Effects on the people, issues around people's health in terms of cancer, deaths, and so on. We're learning to trust them over this, over this process because you're, you're now my partner now, so we can't be lying to one another and we can't be hiding things from one another. So it, it makes the, the relationship a bit stronger. The community of Delaunay and the people of Delaunay have been, uh, have been very open and willing to work with myself and our team. It's been, uh, as everything is, has been dealt with openly and transparently. Uh, we've met many times in the community. There's no, uh, no secrets. Uh, information is out there. People speak from the heart. You know, if Canada worked on it by themselves and gave us a report and said, here, this is what we found, and uh, people will still, still won't trust it. And they'll say, nah, you probably fabricated most of the stuff in there just to say it was uh, okay. And this process, you know, you, we can't do that I mean, because we're, we're quite familiar with the work that's happening. That's extremely valuable to work from that way when you're trying to address these types of concerns. My experience with contaminated sites is that uh, a small part of the issue is technical. A large part of the issue is, in fact, uh, uh, dealing with people. If a widow lost her husband, what, what did, impact did that have on the family economically? I think one of the first things we had to do was uh, come up with a plan, which we call our action plan, what we're going to do. What is it that we needed to look at? And uh, we relate those all to this 77 questions. For the first two years, all we did was study. We picked up uh, scientists, uh, contractors and stuff. We didn't use any government scientists or anything. So we wanted to make sure that we had a, not a biased opinion on this whole issue. We had 10 scientists come in and said, okay, these 77 questions, these are the things you need to look at. So scientifically, these are the studies that you should do to address these questions. The community was involved in all the workshops that we had. We made sure that uh, the questions came directly from the people themselves, not from anybody that works on this file. It comes from regular Joe Blow sitting over there at the house. The public also had access to all these uh, professionals too, so the questions were related from these guys, they were given directly to the scientists, and the scientists was responding to every individual. 
we almost had to develop a whole new slavery language in order to translate to, this, to our people. Canada, in working with us, understands that I can't just communicate, you know, half-life or uh, radiation and uranium to you. Just like in slavery, you can say something in different ways. You need to understand what does that mean, translate it into a new language because there's really no words for that type of stuff, and then add meaning to it. We've been working really well at identifying all the assessments and studies that need to be done. We relate all those uh, studies to all the questions that people have so that at the end of the day when the report comes back we should have an answer for all the questions that people have. One of the 14 points that Cindy worked on was that Canada had to provide us with resources to, to be able to look at this problem. Once we identified everything that we had to do, we put a price tag to it. It does uh, $6.7 million uh, of uh, work that we had to do to answer these questions. Great Bear Lake was highlighted as a contaminant site that Canada wanted to clean up in, in, in Parliament when they said the, they allocated the money with respect to environmental cleanups. They actually highlighted uh, this project. I think it'll be between four to ten years by the time we finish cleaning that whole project up. The number's coming in around 12, probably about 12 to, between 12 and 14 million dollars to clean that site up. The whole bill at the end of the day is going to be close to about 20 million dollars. Now with respect to the mine site itself, you know, when we did sampling in the sediment and the, we started to realize that, you know, they, they, there's no radium and uranium in the tailings. Uh, that was dumped into the lake. It's just uh, metals. The problem with that area is that it's almost 1,500 uh, feet. So it's deep. So we had to understand the, the contours of the, of the bottom of the lake and where the stuff was actually sitting. And it sits in a uh, sort of like a little valley. So the currents probably don't even get at it. We had uh, public workshops with the community, and uh, we told them what you know, we found. And the community said, you know, it's probably safer if we just leave it right where it's sitting. It's uh, not affecting anything. It's not bothering anything. So it's the community that told us that we should consider just leaving it where it is. You know, if we dredge it up, then we might have more problems that way because uh, we're recontaminating things. Well, the Canada Delna Uranium team has finished its report, final report on the process that it's uh, worked through over the last five plus years. And in that report, there's uh, the table's key findings and recommendations. To the unveiling of the CD report that we've been working on for the past five and a half years, um, it was always uh, our intent as a, as, a, as a member of the CDUT to just gather information as a community and our leaders have asked us only to gather information. Once we gather information from that, we can, we can make decisions. Primary finding is that the, you know, the water of Great Bear Lake and the fish in Great Bear Lake and the caribou in the region have not been affected by the mine. That those are both uh, healthy and clean and safe, good to eat, good food, good water. Then we focused in on the port radium site and looked at what are the effects of the port radium mine on the local environment. So the environment right on the mine site itself. So there we looked at the soil, the vegetation, the water, animals. We found that the water itself does not have radium and uranium in it. It has other uh, metals. On the, uh, the water side there is localized effects from the mine. 
And what I mean by that is there is uh, metals, what we call metals or heavy metals, things like uh, arsenic, lead, zinc. Uh, some of those things are above what they would be in the natural environment in some of the water that is ponded at certain places on the mine site itself. Uh, so, for example, if there's a small pond of water about the size of a, a room or a house on top of the tailings area where the tailings and the wastes had been put, it's subsided and there's a small pond there. The, the water that's there is in fact uh, has some contamination of metals. The smaller animals, the uh, grouse and, and rabbits, if they were to uh, feed off uh, the ground and stuff like that, uh, there is some uh, risk to them. One of our cleanup recommendations of course is to remove that ponded water by filling in the depression uh, and recontouring it, filling in the depression, and that will remove that from a, being a source that either the vegetation or the animals could drink from. Through the remediation, we will uh, try to limit uh, their risk, uh, but at the same time, we'll also try to continue to monitor wildlife in that area. Some of the water on the surface obviously runs off into Great Bear Lake, so we look very closely at what the, uh, how clean that water was, what was in that water, as well as what was in the Great Bear Lake, where it went into the lake and at a distance from shore. And again, the findings are that it's very localized. It's, uh, there is some indication of metals right where the water goes in off the site, where the water leaves, the drainage runs off the site into the lake. But when you get a few feet, a uh, few yards offshore, uh, you won't, there isn't any. It's back to normal sort of thing. Under the, re uh, the final report, it's rec recommended that Canada continue to monitor the site and that uh, they test the waters uh, on an ongoing basis. Tailings come from, yeah. as a result of, of the proce uh, mm -hmm. processing and concentrating the material. Yeah. The waste rock is just wa rock that's, that's blasted out and you, you, you look for the, the stuff mm -hmm. that has the most uranium in it and that's the material you process. 700,000 tons of uranium tailings in Great Bear Lake that was one of the primary concerns of the community and, and the government and everyone concerned with the site was what was the condition of those tailings. They will, over a long, long time, they will get covered by some, some amount of uh, sedimentation or some amount of stuff, but that would take a long time because Great Bear Lake is a very clean lake. There was all kinds of studies done to see if they're affecting the fish or the food the fish eat, and that finding indicated they were not affecting the ecosystem. They studied the air over the three or four years. They put out containers and studied the air. So the finding really is there's no dust problem. There's no contamination. From zero to 500, it's about reading 100 micro Runkins per hour. There are levels of radiation on the site. Obviously, they're far above uh, natural conditions. In this area, because we have a large area that has uh, uh, waste rock on it. The, the levels of radiation, though, are not such that they are dangerous to humans and they're not creating any ecological problem for the animals and the, and the wildlife. That said, the, the, the risk really is, is, is associated with long-term occupancy. The, uh, if someone was to go there and live there continuously, then they would in fact have radiation levels that would exceed what are normal guidelines for public health. So the guideline really, or the recommendation is that the site should not be used for more than seasonal use. No one should go there and, and nobody should go there and stay for more than three or four months. At the same time, one of the recommendations was that in fact some of the higher levels of radiation areas would be in fact covered with rock that is, is natural. The ecological risk to caribou in particular has is, is been shown to be non-existent. There is no risk, there is no concern with caribou. It's not going to affect their health or it's not going to affect the health of anybody eating caribou. The site will require licensing under the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, as a former uranium mine. It will also be under certain land use regulations and permits and controls. So part of those will require ongoing monitoring of the water, the wildlife, the fish, just to make sure that what we've found is in fact continuing to be the case. With respect to human health, we feel that uh, people are safe. Over the years we realized that uh, there needs to be some major improvements to the health system. Uh, the health system itself, in simple terms, just reacts to people getting sick only. It doesn't do too much in terms of preventing anything. With respect to the cancer itself, there's very little early detection or 
assessing to see whether or not anybody has uh, got any cancer. And if they do, you know, try to catch it early enough so that they could actually be treated for it. One of the things we found out in the, in the report is that that people, yes, they've been exposed and that they were at an increased risk by being exposed, especially the ore carriers. We can't say for sure that anybody died of cancer because of being exposed. All we can say is that, yes, people were at risk of getting cancer and uh, we have difficulty proving the fact that people did get cancer from uh, poor radium. You know, normally, just if, even if you weren't exposed to radiation, that out of a group of 35 people, we might have had, uh, you know, eight or nine deaths just from cancer normally. That seems to be the rate that uh, they use across Canada now. And so if you were exposed to radiation, they figure that maybe one or two more ore carriers would have uh, uh, got cancer. There is a lot of uh, mental health issues with respect to the, to the elderly ladies and elderly men, and including you know bringing it down to other members in the community that uh, feel the effect of losing their elders. We found out that people didn't have time to grieve and deal with all these issues because there was so many one right after another. And if you think about it, the community itself is population is about 650 people, and everybody there is related. So if you lose somebody in the community. It impacts on everybody, not just uh, the immediate family. Some people have been able to move on, but some people haven't been able to. And uh, the uh, health assessments um, on, on individuals with respect to mental health have determined that there is some uh, grieving, uh, counseling workshops and all those type of things that need to take place. Over the years, we, find, we kind of push the elders out of the way because we took on this new uh, culture and new society and uh, the new culture and new society is, is sort of like designed for me, 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 me and whereas the Aboriginal culture is no, we share, we help and we support one another so trying to spend more time with the youth and, and uh, taking the youth out on the land but we also try to get the elders to do that, not middle-aged people like me. We can participate but it's not the, our program, it's, it's for the youth and it's for the elders. We think this is a way we can somehow try to address dealing with the grieving and the anxiety that people have and also try to strengthen the, the Aboriginal culture and uh, the beliefs of people in terms of supporting one another and, and try to reintegrate the dead end principles that are, are fairly simple but mean lots to, uh, to uh, uh, society and its culture. Somebody needs to talk for the wildlife and, and uh, the trees and the water and the plants. Well, us as Aboriginal people are familiar with all those kind of things because they live in that area. So it's really beneficial if industry and government to work with those people. Traditional knowledge is very important. It plays a significant role in uh, making sure that you understand everything. I think there's a real significant role for elders to play in, in, in this new, new age. They kind of lost them for a while there, and uh, now I say, well, you know, here's a role for them. When you're going to develop an area, if you use traditional knowledge, you can understand that, well, the marten are in that area, or the caribou are in that area, and uh, you wouldn't say no to development, but if you knew that, then you could try to find a balance between, you know, not, not affecting the, these areas of wildlife versus development. So you can somehow come up with a, a compromise on how to make sure that everything's protected. And then there also needs to be uh, mechanisms of, of measurement you know, developing monitoring systems and, and ways of measuring your impacts. Being open and upfront about what is it you're actually doing and then, you know, recognize the benefits that you want to give to these people and, uh, and then at the same time develop a plan, okay, well, this is how we're coming in, this is how we're leaving. What 
it actually finds its way into legislation where you, you're telling this industry and, and governments that you have to, by law, go and find these things out. And you have to involve the people impacted. It's best for play. Uh -huh. And the head part of the woman is a little bit because it's bigger. Mm -hmm. Like big heads. The benefit really is knowledge, and the secondary benefit is, is confidence in that knowledge and having been able to disseminate that to the grassroots and up through the bureaucracy and the federal government. The process had the funds and the resources and the time to in fact uh, generate good science, good traditional knowledge, good oral histories to give us those answers. So there's a fairly high level of confidence in the community and in the federal government that we have knowledge now on which we can go forward and do some further remediation. And sure, there's good monitoring programs. People can hopefully get on with their lives on the human health side of it and the worry and the anxiety side of it. The go forward is more, is a happier picture and a better picture than it was, uh, you know, five years ago before we started the process. I think people are struggling right now with all the development happening and their traditional knowledge and their understanding of how land should be used in particular areas is not being understood properly. And uh, I think if people sort of worked on trying to understand that, and then uh, development can happen. It works. It keeps people happy, keeps people informed. Only way to do business.